Retina Rounds, episode number 57, Subhyloid Hemorrhage. In today's episode, returning guest surgeon Dr. Kirk Ho shows us how to manage some common difficulties when performing a diabetic vitrectomy, this in a patient with a significant macula involving subhyloid hemorrhage. Thank you, Dr. Ho, for sharing this video. So Dr. Ho's patient has a history of proliferative diabetic retinopathy and presented with a sudden onset loss of vision due to a subhyloid hemorrhage involving the macula. You can see that the patient has not had prior PRP. However, prior to surgery, the patient did receive an anti-VEGF injection. Now, Dr. Ho has started by performing a vitrectomy, and you can see as he's performing the vitrectomy, he's trying to find an edge where he can access the, the subhyloid space, uh, really trying to get into the proper plane. You can see he's uh, using the cutter here to try to uh, lift up the edge of the hyloid, uh, but the hyloid is very taut and it has almost like a trampoline-like effect and it's too taut for him to be able to tackle with a cutter. So now he's gone to forceps, and again, you can see as he's trying to uh, grasp the posterior hyaloid face, uh, it's just too taut to be able to get good purchase. And now he's gone on to uh, use a pick. This is sort of like a homemade pick. In this case, the, um, a, uh, a needle has been used to create a, a barb uh, at the end of the needle. And so that can be, that can be done by running uh, a needle, uh, the edge of the needle against a flat surface. And that creates a small, uh, small barb, which can be used as a pick. And you can see that's run over the surface of the, uh, of the posterior hyaloid face, uh, allowing him to create a posterior hyaloidotomy. Now going back to the cutter, he's trying to uh, aspirate the blood, uh, but the blood is, is quite uh, organized. It's, it's more of a clot at this point. Um, however, as he's aspirating, you can see that fluid wave indicating that some BSS has, has dissected the hyaloid face away from the hemorrhage, and that's gonna create some space for him so he can go back with forceps now to unroof the hyaloid over the macular hemorrhage. You can see he's engaging the edge of the hyaloid with forceps and then lifting up. But as he's lifting up, he's not lifting in an anteroposterior fashion. He's trying to limit that. Uh, he's actually peeling it and then going back along the surface of the retina so as to not create too much traction and potentially create a retinal break. He's also being careful to go in areas where he can see if there are any underlying fibrovascular pegs, again, to decrease the risk for a retinal break. So now that some space has been created, Dr. Ho has gone back to the cutter and is now segmenting these areas, following the surface of the retina, staying within the proper plane, uh, which is the space between the posterior hyaloid face and the retina, and he's gonna go ahead and dissect the hemorrhage into smaller, more manageable pieces. And that's gonna allow him to uh, better identify individual fibrovascular pegs in these areas, that can subsequently be segmented and then potentially delaminated. Now Dr. Ho is using the cutter to aspirate the hyaloid face, and you'll notice that, uh, that he's moved to a different area. He's working away from the macular hemorrhage because he doesn't want to pull too hard on that clot. Uh, pulling too hard on that area uh, and, on the surrounding, um, and on the surrounding hemorrhage could potentially create a macular detachment or a posterior break. And so rather he's working on the nasal aspect of the retina where it's a bit safer, even, even if a retinal break is created, although that's not a desired outcome, it's in a far less visually significant area for the patient. And so now he's using the cutter to aspirate up the hyaloid. He's going back to the cutting mode to segment these areas of clot uh, and, uh, and delaminating these areas of fibrovascular proliferation. Now going back to the forceps, he's lifting the hyaloid and unroofing uh, the hyaloid over this hemorrhage. Uh, in the macula, and again, you can see he's not pulling in an anteroposterior fashion. He's really uh, folding it over uh, and uh, and then pulling along the surface of the of the retina, so that the hyaloid face doesn't shear, but also so that he doesn't put any undue traction on the underlying retina. And now that some of the hyaloid has been lifted, it's allowing him to use the fluidics of the machine to propagate the vitreous detachment. So going back to core vitrectomy mode. Uh, you can see he's cutting and removing the vitreous, and this is further propagating the vitreous detachment. You can see the hyaloid coming up, and as the hyaloid is coming up, these, uh, these sequestered clots are coming up as well. So this is a really nice demonstration of slowly lifting up the hyaloid to release that sort of su suction cup-like effect uh, of the posterior hyaloid face, and, um, and then allowing him to then propagate the vitreous detachment more peripherally to remove uh, the subhyaloid hemorrhage. Um, you can see here along the way he's encountering some small bleeders, which is not an uncommon issue. And he's doing a very wise thing here of using the diathermy to get that bleeding under control. Uh, you can get the bleeding under control, of course, with uh, temporary antitamponade, 
Um, but you really want to be careful uh, in these ischemic eyes not to stay on tamponade pressure for too long, uh, which could further exacerbate the ischemic damage. Um, so there are, there are some other areas here of, fibro of vascular proliferation that he's segmenting uh, and uh, delaminating. And you can see that one peg has been segmented, and then he's using the cutter. He's using the cutter. He's delaminating it, going back and forth with different instruments, using the soft tip to remove some blood uh, to identify the sources of bleeding, and then that allows him to go back with the diathermy uh, and get that bleeding under control. The diabetic blood can be quite rich in fibrin, and, and it can create a membrane uh, that's tightly adherent quite quickly. Um, and uh, so you want to try to get, get that bleeding under control so that you're not having to first dissect off fibrovascular proliferations and then having to dissect off, again, highly adherent clots on the retinal surface. Um, so using forceps here, he's creating some space for himself to try to identify the surgical plane that he wants to get into, and then he's going to go back with the vitreous cutter um, uh, and segment these areas, and eventually all of these proliferations will be fully delaminated. And now Dr. Ho is doing some PRP, and what he's doing here is he's actually, uh, with his dominant hand, applying the PRP posteriorly. This is going to be the posterior extent of his PRP, almost uh, delineating uh, how far posteriorly he wants to go, and then he can uh, go back between his dominant and non-dominant hands to fill in uh, the periphery up to the aura serrata. That can be done either under air or with the assistance of scleral depression. And you can see that PRP is, is uh, complete. Uh, you can see how beautiful now the macula looks and the overall retinal anatomy is really beautiful delamination that's been done here. Uh, and now he's doing a full air fluid exchange to remove any residual blood and hopefully to decrease the chance for any oozers uh, in the postoperative period. So here are a few take home points. Subhyloid hemorrhages, especially those seen uh, with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, are a subtype of hemorrhage that really deserves special attention. When the posterior hyaloid face is intact and there's a significant subhyaloid hemorrhage in the macula, early vitrectomy is a good idea. And the reason is that a hemorrhage can trigger an inflammatory response that can result in recruitment of uh, inflammatory cells, inflammatory mediators, neutrophils, macrophages, uh, and this can uh, subsequently result in contraction of the hyaloid. Now, if for a subhyaloid hemorrhage, you have to remember that the diabetic blood is rich in fibrin. That makes it highly adherent. So when blood is compressed between the hyaloid face and the underlying macula, contraction of the hyaloid can easily translate to macular traction and subsequent uh, macular detachment. So since the uh, posterior hyaloid face may be taut, uh, using a forceps or a pick, as was demonstrated uh, in this case, can be useful to create a posterior hyaloidotomy. And this can allow for sometimes the blood to be evacuated if it's sufficiently uh, liquefied. Uh, or in, in, this, in this case, when the, when the blood is a little bit more clotted, it does allow for hydrodissection of the hyaloid away from the blood uh, and the retina and for space to be created that'll make dissection a bit easier. Now, diabetic vitrectomies are a little like a puzzle, which I think makes them uh, challenging, uh, but fun at the same time. Uh, and when one area presents uh, a problem or introduces too much risk, uh, I would recommend trying to go to an, a, an easier area first. Uh, and Dr. Ho demonstrated this. You know, when he was working over the macula, he did what he could. There was some concern that maybe he was uh, further uh, dissection or manipulation in areas where he couldn't see completely might introduce the risk for uh, 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 some macular pathology. And so he worked on the nasal part of the retina in a safer area where he had better visualization. And when you, when you come back to that difficult area, it can be some oftentimes easier to manage, as in this case, when the hyaloid was propagated nasally and then brought around temporally, making the temporal segmentation and delamination easier. And finally, don't forget about hemostasis. Uncontrolled bleeding can result in clots that are difficult to dissect off the retina and can prolong the surgery. Uh, and when achieving hemostasis, uh, hemostasis with tamponade, you should remember not to leave the inf infusion pressure up too long as this can further damage ischemic tissue. You want to uh, get uh, quick control. You can use uh, uh, tamponade pressure and then use the diathermy to uh, actually uh, achieve uh, hemostasis. Now, one other step that I like to perform is to actually lower the pressure to a physiologic level. Oftentimes, we're operating at intraocular pressures of 25 to even 35 and that's not the pressure that the patient will be in in the postoperative period. So when you are trying to assess for adequate hemostasis, lowering the pressure to a more physiologic level, say 15 millimeters of mercury, mercury, or even lowering the pressure further to say five or 10 millimeters of mercury to really see whether or not there are any oozing vessels is a good idea to make sure that you've got good hemostasis 
that's going to help decrease the chance for uh, post-operative vitreous hemorrhage and it will help to speed up the patient's visual recovery. Again, thank you, Dr. Ho, for sharing this case. This really gives us a great opportunity to review some of the, uh, the important fundamental concepts of diabetic vitrectomy and to highlight uh, subhyaloid hemorrhage as an entity that really needs more urgent intervention. This is a beautifully performed surgery, and I hope everybody enjoyed watching. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.